If you will, take your Bibles and open with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. We're going to start at verses 1 and 2 for our study together this morning. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Of course, on Sunday evenings, we're studying through the book of Romans, and we have gotten to this uh, chapter and this passage in the book, and it is the beginning of a, uh, a new section in the book of Romans where Paul is going to focus on the application of the truth that he's been teaching through the first 11 chapters of this book. If the gospel is God's power to save, and it is, and the only way to be saved, then what does that look like in a person's life? How do you live according to the gospel, and what is it, uh, what is it, how does it manifest itself? And one of those things that takes place is a transformation And the Bible uses that word here, and it's a powerful word, and I thought it would be good for us to focus in on it for our study this morning to kind of set the stage for looking at Romans 12 and the rest of the book of Romans, but also just to remind us about the transforming power of Jesus and, of course, of his gospel because it is his word. Paul says it this way in Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Greek word for transform is the word metamorpho, And uh, we get our word metamorphosis from it. When we think of metamorphosis, we usually think of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly because we use that word for that process in kind of the scientific sense. And it really is a, a good illustration of what that word means. It's the idea of a complete transformation. It's the same Greek word that's used in Matthew and Mark and Luke in the account of the transfiguration of Jesus. We talked about that in our Bible study this morning, how Jesus was Jesus in in a human body. He was his normal appearance and person here on the earth. And when they went up on the mountain, he was transfigured, literally went through a metamorphosis and was completely changed. And he began to shine as bright as the sun. His clothes became pure white and shining with light. Uh, All of this a demonstration of his glory. But the point is that he was changed from his physical appearance to a spiritual appearance. And that was the metamorphosis that took place. And what's fascinating about that is that we can kind of understand when we look at the transfiguration what what happened. Jesus was this way and then he became in in a different way, in a different form. But sometimes we have trouble when it comes to applying that same word and that same process in our own lives, that we also are transformed, we are transfigured. When we become Christians, there, there is a very stark line of demarcation in our lives from before I was a Christian to after. And that line, you know, the dividing line, the thing that marks it is our baptism into Christ. And when we go down into that watery grave and the blood of Jesus is applied to us and all of our sins are washed away, what comes up from the water is a transformed person, one who's gone through a metamorphosis. We're completely different than who we were before, at least we're supposed to be. That's the process of conversion. Believing in Jesus, understanding who he is, causes us to realize that we are wrong, not just in our actions, but in our thinking and our understanding and everything. And so we're going to listen to him now and follow what he says. And so we repent. We change our minds toward the way we used to think about things, sin and and righteousness. We now have a different perspective on what is right and what is wrong. And because of that, We are motivated to acknowledge publicly that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I'm not afraid to say it. I don't care who knows it because I've come to understand that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that's all that matters. 
And so I confess it, and because he commanded me to, I'm baptized for the remission of my sins. And I let someone else take control of my body as I let Jesus take control of my mind and my spirit. And I'm lowered into the water. His blood washes away my sins. And the person who comes up is a new person, a new creation in Christ. And I'm supposed to be, from that day forward, a different individual than I was before I was baptized because of the transforming power of Jesus. So I want us to think about that idea and and what the Bible teaches us concerning the ways that Jesus can transform, change us, metamorphosize us through the power of his blood and the power of the gospel. So the first thing we want to think about is that Jesus can transform a person from darkness to light. One of the, I guess, most frightening descriptions of of sin and of living in sin is this idea of darkness. We're often afraid of the dark because you can't see, we don't know what's going on in the shadows and someone might hurt us and all these things. Sometimes they're rational fears when we're younger and even when we're older, but there are also some real things in the dark that, that we are afraid of. But in spite of that fact, there are multitudes who choose to live in spiritual darkness, to live in the darkness of sin. And the Bible describes sin in that way. Listen to Ephesians 5, beginning in verse number 3. Paul, he's going to list these sins, but listen to what he says. He says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. And that means don't do it one time in your life, but it also means don't let one member of the congregation do it. It shouldn't be named once. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye, therefore, partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The Bible tells us that when we commit sins, we are living in darkness. And it's darkness because, number one, we're not seeing clearly. To make those choices and to do those things means we don't properly see and understand what we're doing. Uh, because we've closed our eyes to the truth of God's word for whatever reason. Either we've been deceived or we've just decided that we don't want to listen to what God says because we want to do these things, but we're in darkness. There's a blindness to it. But when I become a Christian, my sins are washed away, but my heart is also changed so that I see the truth about those sins. And I want you to notice again the words that Paul uses here and, and think about the contrast between what Paul says about sin and what we say about sin in our world today. He names the sin specifically and he calls them exactly what they are. Fornication is fornication. It's not, you know, shacking up. It's not having a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you were hooking up with or whatever, but it's fornication. It's, it's wrong. It's sin. That relationship outside of marriage is sinful. It's uncleanness. It's connected to covetousness because we're desiring something that we don't have the right to have. He talks about filthiness. He talks about, in in verse 5, the word whoremonger, right? Who uses that kind of language today? But he's calling sin exactly what it is. It makes us unclean. He says covetousness, it's idolatry. If you love things, if you love money, To that extent, then you actually have an idol in your life. You're not worshiping God. You're worshiping those things. And he says, in those practices, there's no inheritance in the kingdom. You're not saved from your sins, and you can't go to heaven, right? We don't talk about sin in those terms anymore. We always are making excuses for it and justifying ourselves in things that we do that are wrong. But Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't do those things. And don't partake even with those who do those things because it's darkness. And we need to understand that 
doing those things and living that way in that kind of lifestyle is choosing to live in darkness and blindness. In Ephesians 5 and verse uh, 11, he goes on to say, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And then listen to this. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You know, it's one of the most tragic things in the world that we live in today that nothing is shameful anymore. Things that people do in secret and in the privacy of their own homes or in, you know, the, the dark places where they go to, to commit their sins are, are common talk around the dinner table because it's right there on the television, right? And, and part of the reason that the devil wants us to talk about those things is because even if we're condemning it, the more we talk about it, it makes it more acceptable because everybody's thinking about it and everybody you know, has it on their minds. God says it's a shame to even talk about those things, right? And again, we don't have that perspective on sin. We want to talk about everything because it makes it better or whatever. But it can open the door to you know, the curiosity and lead us into, into doing those things. But the point here is not to have fellowship with any of that because it's darkness and unfruitful. It's not going to produce anything good in our lives. So sin, immorality, wickedness is just that. It's darkness. But it's not just doing those things that the Bible calls darkness. In Matthew 5 and verse uh, 15, rather, in verse 19, verse 9, Jesus says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he explains what he means in verse 12 when the Bible says that his disciples came to him and said, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? So you said that their worship is unacceptable, that it's vain. Don't you know you hurt their feelings? You made them mad. They were upset. Jesus says in verse 13, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Maybe they did get their feelings hurt, but they need to know the truth, that they're not of God, and one day they're going to stand and give an account in judgment. So he says in verse 14, let them alone. They be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. They're blind. That's darkness. They cannot see because they're in the darkness of sin. And the sin is not doing those immoral things we are talking about earlier, but it's teaching and believing error, the doctrines and traditions of men. And those who teach those things are blind because they're not teaching the light of the gospel, the truth of what Jesus says. And the people who follow them are also blind in darkness. And they're both headed for a fall, fall into the ditch, headed for trouble. And so it's our duty, again, just as to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness, it's our duty to teach the truth and try to correct error in the world because it's darkness. But then we have the teaching from John chapter 9 and the story of the man who was born blind and Jesus healed him from his blindness. You have a picture and a demonstration of a hardness of heart in that story that also shows spiritual darkness. Verse 29 says, We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Of course, they're talking about Jesus. So Jesus healed a man who had been blind from his birth. And the Pharisees say, Well, we know that God talked to Moses, but we don't know who this guy is, Jesus. And here's what the blind man says. He answered, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. He healed me of blindness that I've had from the, the moment I was born, and you can't understand where he's from. There's only one place he can be from to have that power and to do that. But their hearts were so hardened against Jesus, they wouldn't accept the evidence. So verse 39 says that Jesus said, For judgment am I come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. And he uses blindness in two different ways there. There's blindness, which has to do with the Pharisees and the hardness of their heart. And then there's true blindness, where we stop 
looking at things our way and we see them the Lord's way. So we become blind to the world and blind to, to our own ideas and our eyes open to the truth. And so Jesus basically says you know, to the Pharisees, there's none so blind as he who will not see. They refused to see the truth. Even though it was right before them, you know, staring them in, in the face, they rejected it. And so all of these individuals in these categories are in darkness and again, sometimes we don't see things that way. We, we have the idea that talking about sin in those terms is judgmental and, and unkind and not being compassionate. But the truth is the truth, and it has to be stated because those who are in darkness need to recognize they're in darkness so they can come to the light. And if we just appease people's conscience and tell them everything's okay and the Lord loves you anyway, well, they'll just continue in their darkness. And we become blind leading the blind. And so just as the Bible does and just as Jesus did, sin has to be shown for what it truly is, spiritual darkness. But Jesus has the power to transform us from darkness to light. And he can do that because he is the light of the world. He says that in this same context of healing the blind man in John 9 and verse 5, as long as I am in the world... I am the light of the world. He said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 1 and verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then we read, of course, that Jesus was the true light in verse 9, that lighteth every man which cometh into the world. And so Jesus is light, and that makes his word the source of light. He's the source, and his word reveals that life to us. And so he is the bearer of light. He brings truth to the world, and it's able to bring us out of darkness. It's called the light of life there in John 1 and verse 4, because those who obey the truth have spiritual life and the hope of eternal life, everlasting life. And that life comes from light, the light of truth. So how do we have that kind of life and that kind of light? Well, it takes obedience to the gospel. In Acts 26 and 18, Saul was told that God had chosen him for a purpose. And that purpose was to go to the Gentiles, verse 18 says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, Jesus says. Paul's mission was to preach the gospel, and by doing so, he would open eyes so people could see the truth, and when they saw the truth, they would be turned from darkness to light. That's the power of Jesus to transform through the gospel. If you're still in Romans over in chapter 13 and verse 12, he says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in day, in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And so Paul says, the darkness is over. If you're a Christian, you're, you've come out of the darkness. Don't go back into it by practicing these evil things. Don't live a life of sin. But instead, he says, put on the armor of light. And to explain that, he says in verse 14, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we put on Christ in baptism, Galatians 3.27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So when we obey the gospel, we put on Christ. And the point is that once we put him on, don't ever take him off. And sometimes we do. We stumble and we fall and we do things that are wrong. And, and we, we put Jesus away so we can go back into the darkness. Well, to come out, we have to put Christ back on. Put on that armor of light. We repent of our wrongs and confess them and pray for forgiveness. The Lord forgives us and we're restored to fellowship. But the point is that the power of the gospel is to take us out of darkness into light. And it depends upon our choosing to do so, to obey and to live in obedience. And then as Christians, what do we do? We walk 
in the light. 1 John 1, 7. Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew 5 and verse 14. Jesus says, ye are the light of the world. And he says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. <clears throat> and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So walking in the light means living as light, being an example of truth, living in obedience to the gospel. So if we accept Jesus and obey his gospel, we come out of darkness and into light. On the other hand, if we reject Jesus, we are choosing to continue to walk in darkness. I want to read a passage to you from John chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 16, <clears throat> because we all know John 3, 16, and we all know how it is used by the religious world. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we're usually told that that means just believe in Jesus and, and you're saved, you have eternal life. But listen to how Jesus continues. He doesn't just stop there. As powerful and important as that verse is, he goes on to say, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. This is much more than just believing in Jesus, that he is the Son of God. This is believing that fact, obviously, but then coming to the light, the light of his word, doing what his word teaches, so it will you know, demonstrate, it will be manifest that we're serving God. It's not just believing, but it's obeying. It's doing what Jesus commands. But notice the contrast there. This is the condemnation. People who don't believe in Jesus and don't obey his gospel, Jesus didn't come to condemn them, this passage says. He came to save them. He didn't have to come to condemn them because they were already condemned. And that's the state of the world without Christ. It is in condemnation. It is in darkness. It's a world of darkness. And Christ came into that world of darkness as light to draw people to him. But who's going to come to, to Jesus, to the light, if we're living in darkness, if our deeds are evil? Only those who desire to come out of darkness and to have their sins forgiven and removed, they're the ones who will be drawn to him. Those who love the darkness, who want to continue in sin and to practice evil and wickedness, will not come to him. But those who choose to do the truth will. And so Jesus has the power to transform us from darkness to light. But if we reject him, we're choosing to remain in darkness. And what happens if we choose darkness? Well, Matthew 25 and verse 30 says, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a picture that is of hell. It's outer darkness, utter darkness. When we think of darkness in this world, we very rarely have any experience with true darkness. There's so many sources of light around us. But outer darkness is complete and total separation from all light. And not just physical light, because we're talking about in the spiritual realm, but this is separation from the light of God, from the light of truth. There's no truth in, in hell. There's no friendship in hell. People have this idea that I'd rather be lost and go to hell with my friends, you know, than to, than, than to go to heaven. People don't want to live the Christian life because they think it's not fun. I'm going to have fun with my friends and, and we'll have fun, you know, in hell. There's no fun in hell. There's no friendship. There's no one there who cares about you at all because everyone is so concerned about themselves from what they're suffering and enduring. They don't care if anybody else is there or not. The devil certainly doesn't care. 
there's no light at all in hell. It's outer darkness. In fact, 2 Peter 2, 4 says, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. So it's not just outer darkness, but you're bound in darkness. And Jude says that they're raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So it's eternal darkness, bound in chains of darkness, in outer darkness, in eternal darkness. That's the horror of hell. And that's where we're headed if we choose to live a life of sin. But Jesus has the power to transform, to bring us out of darkness and into light. And not just to bring us out of it, but to change us from servants of darkness to servants of light and of righteousness. That's the transforming power of Jesus. Now, as we go along with that, we notice also that Jesus has the power to transform someone from being an enemy to becoming a friend. Transformation from, from enmity to friendship. There are many people who are enemies of God and enemies of Jesus and enemies of the gospel, even many who claim to be Christians who claim to love the Lord, are in fact his enemies. And here's how we know that. Philippians 3 and verse 18, Paul says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So we have a description of someone who is an enemy of the cross of Christ. It's someone whose God is their belly, the King James Version said. The word, it's the word for appetite. So what rules their life is their own desires, what they want, what they think, what they feel. So I know what the Bible says, but I want to do it this way. Their God is themselves. They worship what they want. They do what they want. They've made themselves their own God. They're enemies of the cross. And they dress nicely on Sunday, and they wear their coat and tie, and they stand in pulpits, and they tell you what you want to hear. But they're following their own teaching, the doctrines and traditions of men. And Paul says they're enemies of Jesus, those whose glory is in their shame. Not only do they, they teach their doctrines and their opinions, but they're very proud of it. And I don't mean proud in pride, you know, the sinful nature of pride. But they take glory in teaching their error and their false doctrine. They take glory in the numbers who come to hear them preach their error and how many members of the congregation they are, uh, there are where they worship. They, they take glory in making fun of and running down those who teach the truth, those who that believe that baptism is necessary for salvation. What silly people they are. And sometimes they even go further and, you know, accuse us of being a cult or accuse us of teaching work salvation or water salvation and they take glory in something that's absolutely shameful because they're twisting the scriptures to teach their error they're enemies of Jesus but they think that they're his friends and they take glory in that and then he says they mind earthly things they're more focused on the earthly than the spiritual meaning they do what they want instead of what the bible says but they're enemies. Colossians 1.21 says, You that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So those who, who teach and follow the doctrines and traditions of men, they are enemies of Jesus, but also those who practice wicked works. And wicked works, of course, are deeds or actions of wickedness, sinfulness, things that are against God. But notice that they were enemies in their mind by wicked works. It wasn't just what they did, but it was even what they thought. Their attitude and their motives were unjust, not what God said, which made their works wicked. So sometimes you can even do the right thing, and if your heart's not in the right place, the right thing that you did becomes a wicked work because you've done it for the wrong reason and the wrong motivation. I think about Paul talking about those who preach Christ, some out of envy and some out of strife and some out of contention. They were doing a good thing. They were preaching Christ, 
But their motives were entirely wrong. And Paul understood that it didn't matter to the audience as long as they were hearing the truth, but those individuals would have to give an account for their hearts one day before the Lord. And so having our hearts in the wrong place and doing things that are wrong, those are wicked works, and it makes us enemies. And then you have someone like Elymas in Acts 13 and verse 8. Elymas the sorcerer withstood them, the Bible says, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And again, here's Paul calling things as they are. This was a man... Paul was preaching the gospel. Elymas was trying to keep people from believing the gospel, trying to turn them away from the truth, from the faith in Christ. And Paul called him what he was. He was an enemy of all righteousness because he was trying to keep people from hearing and obeying the truth. And again, he was full of subtlety and mischief, just like the devil. So he was a child of the devil, doing the devil's work. But he was an enemy of righteousness. And then James says in James 4 and verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Too many times we desire to be friends of the world, or at least to be friendly with the world. We don't want them to think ill of us, or we don't want to hurt their feelings, or we don't want to have them you know, make fun of us or ridicule us. We want to get along with the world, and so we compromise our beliefs. We water down our stand for the truth in order to, to fit in. But trying to be a friend of the world makes one an enemy of God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. We have to be separate from the world unless we want to be God's enemies. So Jesus has the power to transform his worst enemy into a friend and we just think about one example and we won't read all the passages that relate to this because we know the story but think about Saul of Tarsus right in Acts chapter 8 verses 1 through 4 he was persecuting the church in chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 of course he was sent to Damascus with letters to arrest Christians he was complicit in their arrest and even sometimes in their executions they're being put to death Saul was an enemy of Christ and of the church. But what happened in Acts chapter 9? The Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and gave him an opportunity to be forgiven. And so he sent Ananias to him who told him, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. The Bible tells us in Acts 9 that Paul immediately arose and was baptized. He did just what was said. And he became an apostle of Christ, an enemy of Jesus who was trying to destroy his message and his influence and his body, the church, became a friend of Jesus, an apostle who could then go into the world and preach and teach the message that he'd previously been trying to to stop and to destroy. I want us to read that in Galatians chapter 1, what Paul says about it just for the sake of emphasis. But Galatians 1 and verse 13, listen to what Paul says. He says, For you have heard of my conversion, uh, conversation rather, in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So beyond measure. The normal person would have persecuted this far. Paul went further, right? He was so committed to it. In fact, Acts 9 talks about him breathing out threatenings and slaughter, and it literally means breathing in, that this was his breath of life. It was what he lived for. He breathed, he lived, his heart beat for persecuting the church. He says in verse 14, profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Then in verse 15, he says, but... When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. 
Notice what Paul says. I was an enemy. I was beyond measure destroying Christ, but the Lord showed me grace. And when he offered that to me, immediately I responded and became a friend. No longer an enemy, but a friend. And one more passage relating to Paul. 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 and 13. And then we'll bring this together and, and to a close. Paul says, I think... Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And then he says in verse 17, Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's one of those doxologies, right? So notice what Paul says. I was an enemy. I was a blasphemer. I was persecuting the church. But God showed me mercy. And when he did, even though I was the chief of sinners, the greatest sinner in the history of the world, that's how Paul viewed himself, the Lord offered me mercy. And I accepted his offer and I obeyed his gospel and I was forgiven and made a friend. And that's why he gives praise and honor and glory to God because he understood what God had done for him. The Bible tells us in James 2.23 about Abraham that he believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Abraham was the friend of God because he followed God. He accepted God's truth and by faith he obeyed whatever God commanded him. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Jesus paints this picture of friendship and, and being enemies. And the friendship is that if you are his, and of course he's talking directly to the apostles here, and they had that special relationship as his ambassadors, but the principle applies that if we do what he says, if we obey his will, if we walk in the light and live according to the gospel, we are friends with God, friends with deity, friends with Jesus in the sense that we're forgiven and we're accepted and we're part of his family. If we choose that, however, we're going to be enemies of the world and the world will hate us and the world will persecute us and the world will want to destroy us. And very often what we do in those situations is try to make friends with the world and to make peace with the world, but that makes us enemies of God. And we have to choose who we want to be friends with who we want to live with, where we want to go when we die. And that choice ultimately comes down to who we're going to attach ourselves to in this life, to the world or to the Savior. When we sin and we practice those works of darkness, it makes us God's enemy. And we understand, or at least I hope we understand, that being an enemy of God guarantees our defeat and our destruction. Because as enemies of God, we try to fight against him. We're never going to win that battle. God is always going to defeat us. But he offers us friendship. Out of his mercy, out of his love, out of his grace, he wants us to be friends. And not just friends, he wants us to be family. 
He wants us to live with him in this life and to dwell in his house forever in that eternal home in heaven. But the choice, as always, is ours. We can choose to continue in darkness, to do those things that are sinful and against God's will, and be his enemies. Or we can choose to listen to the light of truth that comes from the word of Jesus, to look at his example of light, and obey his gospel. And by doing so, we'll become the enemy of the world, but we'll be friends with God, living in light, saved from our sins, with an eternal home in heaven. And the key to all of those things is the transforming power of Jesus. It's what he's able to do to make us friends who live and walk in light rather than enemies who are lost in darkness. So he has the power to do it. There's no doubting his power and the power of his gospel. That's Paul's whole point in Romans. The gospel is God's power to save. It can do what it says it will do if you and I will just be obedient to it. If you need to do that today, the opportunity is yours. Put on Christ in baptism. If you believe in him and are willing to repent of your sins and confess his name, that you're ready to be baptized, to be transformed into a new creation, into light, as a friend of God, on your way to an eternal home in heaven. We can help you do it. If you have done those things and haven't been faithful, if you've gone back into the darkness, back into enemy territory, and you need to come home again, You can do that as well. The gospel is the way. Repent of your wrongs. Confess them. Pray to God for forgiveness. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. And God will do just what he promises. Forgive and restore. Transform us again. Salvation will be ours. And heaven can be our eternal home. If you need to do that, to have the transforming power of Jesus in your life, the opportunity is yours. Why not come forward and respond as we stand and as we sing?